Uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about how all truth is God's truth, right? All truth comes from God, but not all truth is found in the Bible. And we use the example of one plus one equals two. That's a true statement, isn't it? True statement that comes from God, but yet that truth isn't necessarily found in the Scripture, is it? And so we can understand that while all truth comes from God, all truth from God can be, I mean, we can discover these truths, but it's not necessarily specifically recorded in the Scripture. And there's a truth in this movie that we're going to be talking about here today that I think applies to this study on the doctrines of the church. Grace Baptist, we have this little blue, blue folder. I don't know. I mean, it's been around, not blue, but it's been around since, what, 1956? Is that when the church was founded? Glenn, is that right? 1956? 53. All right, 53. So a little bit before I was born. All right, 1953. It's been around for a long time. And we have our doctrine. You know, they put together a doctrinal statement. And we wanted, you guys know the church leadership, and we have a lot of new guests coming in, and as we were thinking about the purpose of Grace Baptist, which is what? To make mature followers of Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's our purpose. Make mature followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, yes, we want to have, we want to be able to, to grow the church, but that's God's job, not our job, right? God does that. And God is really the only one that makes people mature, but we want to give opportunities for you guys that have teaching so that you guys can grow in your faith, in your knowledge, in your understanding, and in practical living. That's the purpose of our church, is to help people grow through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not here, I mean, yeah, we're in the middle of a building project, but we can't take our eyes off of what God is doing and what brought us to this point, and that's fulfilling our purpose, make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And so in light of that, this is why we're going through the doctrines of the church. What is it that we at Grace Baptist believe? What do we believe? Some of you have read this. Many of you probably have not. And I would encourage you to grab one of these things. We've got some in the back. I can always print more off. But today we're going to be looking at the second one. We talked last week, or two weeks ago, I'm sorry, about the doctrine of the Bible. Okay? Why do we believe the Bible is true? And we went through that just briefly. We did a bird's eye view, and all of these we're going to do a bird's eye view because honestly, you spend hours in Bible college on each of these doctrines, and we're going to try to do it in 35 minutes. And while I talk fast, again, we're going to try to keep it down low. So we're going to do just a bird's eye view. And today we're going to be talking about this doctrine of God, theology proper, really. Before we start, let's open up with a word of prayer. God, we're coming to you today desiring to learn something. And God, I pray that you would speak through me today that you would open our hearts to learn something about you that we could apply to our lives. Give us your wisdom today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as we consider this whole thing, we're going back to Tim Allen and God. There's this quote that I was talking about there that I think, and I put it in your outlines just for kicks and giggles, that I think really applies to this understanding of God. He says this phrase, he said, Seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. It's mentioned in both of those movies, the Santa Claus and the Santa Claus 2. Seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. Now think about that for just a minute. When it comes to the doctrine of God, when it comes to understanding God's word, when it comes to faith in God, many of us, for many of us, the first step is belief. And once we believe, then we begin to see all the ways that God works, don't we? Seeing isn't believing, believing is seeing. When it comes to understanding God's word, oftentimes it starts with belief. Belief that this is true. And when you have that belief that it's true, then you begin to see the things that it says are indeed true. Because if it was one of these things that it was like one plus one equals two, well, everybody in the world believes that, right? That's empirical evidence. You can look at that, absolutely. God's word isn't necessarily like that. We just got done with the study in Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, I'm going to read this verse to you. It says this, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It would not be faith if we could see it. It would not be faith if we could see it. And God wants us to have faith. That requires us to believe in something unseen something that we cannot measure. And all of these doctrines require that same belief. So as we get started in this today, I want you to understand that the first step here is faith. Seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. All right, we're talking about theology proper today. Theology proper. This is the idea of God. 
right? The idea that God exists, theology proper. Within this, there's a couple different things. There's theology proper. You've got God the Father, we can talk about, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, which is those three combined. All of those we can talk about in theology proper, and many times those are combined, sometimes in, in Bible college classes and things like that, but we're going to divide them out. Today we're going to talk about just the existence of God. Can we... Why do we believe in the existence of God? Next week we're going to talk about paterology, which is the existence of God the Father. What does it mean? What is God the Father? Who is God the Father? What is He like? The attributes of God the Father. Theology proper defined is this. The study of all the Bible teaches of the being and attributes of God. All the Bible teaches of the being and attributes of God. Charles Hodge in Systematic Theology put that down for us. I really like that definition. So it, what, is, what is the being of God? What are the attributes of God? As we learn that, we're going to be studying theology proper. Now, Grace Baptist Church, we have a long statement that we have in this. It says, we believe in God the Father, perfect in holiness, infinite in wisdom, measureless in power. We rejoice that he concerns himself with the affairs of men, that he hears and answers prayer, and that he saves from sin and death all who come to him through Jesus Christ. There are a lot of doctrines at work in this one paragraph. We're going to focus on the first four words. We believe in God. That's what we're looking at today. We believe in God. And we're going to try to give an explanation as to why we at Grace Baptist Church believe in God. Two weeks ago, when we went through the study of the Bible, we talked about natural revelation, the study of creation, and special revelation, which is God's Word inspired, okay, passed down through men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, recorded for us. Special revelation, things directly from God to man. We are not going to look at this idea of God today through special revelation. We're going to look at it through natural revelation, which is a study of that which is around us, the study of how we are made up, and how we understand things. We're going to try to reason our way through it, again, with the, found, with the understanding that, in reality, you can't reason your way. You have to believe. But there are arguments that point to the existence of God. The first argument we're going to look at, and I love these words because they're really big, cosmological. You guys ever heard of that one? The cosmological argument for the existence of God. Okay? The cosmological argument for the existence of God says this. The existence of the universe requires a creator as every house must have a builder. Floyd Berrickman is book Practical Christian Theology, which is a great book. If you're ever studying for ordination, who here is ever studying for ordination? Anybody here? Okay, never mind. All right, he's got a lot of questions at the end of each section that really help you along. little tip in case one of you guys wants to do that someday. His book, he says this. He says, the existence of the universe requires a creator as every house must have a builder. And we understand that, right? We understand as we look around us, this church had a builder, didn't it? We know that. Things aren't here necessarily by chance. Now people say, well, okay, we're going to do the Big Bang Theory, right? The Big Bang Theory, things came from the Big Bang and they just happened. That takes faith, doesn't it? It takes faith to believe that. It also takes faith to believe in a creator. So my question is, which one are you going to believe in? As we give these arguments today, I'm hopefully going to begin to sway you, if you're not already swayed, to the idea that it makes more sense to believe in God than it does to believe in what the secular world says. Okay? As we understand this cosmological argument, we understand that something, we had to come from somewhere, didn't we? We had to come from somewhere. Where did we come from? What is our beginning? What is it? And so while the world tries to explain it away, different methods, we as believers, believing in God's word, special revelation, say, oh, we came from God. That's what the word says. I believe the word is true. Therefore, I see God. I believe in God. I see it. The cosmological argument. The next one here is a teleological argument. Actually, there's a verse I want to blow it with this. Hebrews 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, I really like that. That makes it pretty clear, doesn't it? For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. That is the cosmological argument in a Bible verse for you. All right? And I love going to the Bible for passages. I've told you guys before, I said, who cares what I have to say? What's the Bible have to say, right? And so we look at that and say, all right, here it is. Every house has to have a builder. The builder of all things is God. It doesn't get any more clear than that. 
Now again, that's God, that's special revelation, okay? What we believe comes from God, proving that God is indeed real. If this didn't come from God, this could just be made up, right? I understand that you can break down all these arguments, but I'm also saying that when I believe God is true, God has proven himself over and over and over again. The cosmological argument. Teleological argument says this, the design, order, and purpose that are manifest in the universe show an intelligent creator who planned and constructed the universe, okay? The design, the order, the purpose, as we look at things, we say, man, everything fits together. That couldn't happen by chance. Not only did we not come from nowhere, so to speak, we had to come from somewhere, and then we were put together with such intricacy that we see there had to be a designer behind that. That is a teleological argument, that there is a designer putting everything together. He planned out, he constructed the universe. This is the, what's called the teleological argument for the existence of God. Look at this verse. Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. When we look at the heavens around us and we see how things fall into place, it's, it's just a perfect match. And they say, well, the Big Bang, again, they explain that way through the Big Bang and, and different things like that. Well, well, how does that explain planets that are rotating backwards? That doesn't make sense, does it? And an explosion, something like that, everything's going to go the same direction and it's rotating backwards? That doesn't make any sense, and yet there are. They can't explain that away. The teleological argument explains that away because God designed it. Thinking they became wise, they became as fools, as Romans tells us. i got an example to look at here. This is a bombardier beetle. He's a cute little guy, isn't he? All right, you can laugh. That's fine. Right up here, there are two little... You kind of see it. The picture's a little blurry, and I, I'm, I apologize for that. It showed up clear on my computer. But there are three little sacks back here. This is a cutout of the, of the bombardier beetle, so you can see how this works, okay? We've got three little sacks back here. One, two, and three. Now, evolution says that things evolve gradually over time, right? That's what evolution teaches us. Things evolve gradually over time. Animals will try something. If it doesn't work, then they'll do something else or whatever, and they slowly adapt in order to survive. Is that what evolution basically teaches? I mean, to a degree, right, in summation. So let's look at this bombardier beetle for just an example here. I mentioned this thing a year ago, roughly, but I want to be a little bit more detailed on it today. These two sacks, one of them holds hydrogen peroxide. Okay, it's a byproduct of an animal's metabolism. Hydrogen peroxide is. All right? So an evolutionist, would, they would see that sack and say, oh, well, the bombardier beetle just decided to keep his hydrogen peroxide. Everything else got rid of it. Okay? So let's roll with that one. All right? This one over here is filled with hydroquinones. Okay? Hydroquinones is something that all animals really have. They use it to harden their shells and things like that. And so, yeah, again, all creatures have those. So an evolutionist would say, well, the bombardier beetle decided to go ahead and keep both of those. All right? and keep them separately in a sack. And then it decided to go ahead and put a third one down here, and what happens is when it mixes those together, it creates an explosion. Literally an explosion, okay? This is coming out over boiling point is what happens. I got this off of an evolution website this week, and I laughed as I read it, but it's awesome, okay? Because it describes what happens here. The high, in the third chamber, the hydrogen peroxide rapidly decomposes into oxygen and boiling water, while the hydroquinones oxidize into benzoquinones, which is a highly irritating chemical that have been known to stain the skin of human handlers a yellowish-brown for up to three weeks. This mix explodes out of the beetle, not as a single stream, but as a volley of rapid-fire blasts in what scientists have likened to the pulsing propulsion system of Germany's V-1 buzz bomb in World War II. The consequent chemical burn incapacitates smaller attackers like ants and spooks much, much larger foes as well, such as unfortunate amphibians. You've got temperatures over 220 degrees. You've got chemical burn. You've got the steam coming off like smoke, and then the reaction kind of hisses, says entomologist Terry Irwin, Smithsonian Institute. That adds up to a bad situation for any hungry frog that, any hungry frog that pokes his tongue in the wrong place. And I love this. I love how they explain this. They say it's an incredible defense to have evolved for sure, but the chemicals here are actually quite uncomplicated. Listen to this. I'm going to say it again. An incredible defense to have evolved for sure, but the chemicals here are actually quite uncomplicated. Hydrogen peroxide, a natural byproduct of metabolism. Insects use quinones to harden their shells. The bombardiers have just figured out how to store the chemicals instead of breaking them down or using them. Now, if that doesn't make you laugh, I don't know what does. Because I sit here and think, imagine the first one says, you don't want to hang on to those two chemicals. I'm going to put them in the same place. 
What do you have? Well, last fall I described to you, you have popcorn beetles. Bam, 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 right? <laughs> you have a whole generation of beetles that didn't quite make it. Now, what's the next generation going to do? And you, well, what next generation? The first one didn't make it. And you're right, they didn't. So do you have your guinea pig? Hey, Uncle Scott, drink some of this, will you? Let's see what happens here. Okay, maybe. Does it take a little bit more faith to believe that that happened gradually over time than the whole idea that God designed it at once? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then that sack right there, and some of the bombardier beetles, that sack, it's a cannon turret. And he can point it every direction except at his face. If an ant gets on his back, he can point it at his back. If it's under his stomach, he can point it under his stomach. He can point it anywhere he wants to except at his face. And this has gradually evolved? That doesn't even make sense, does it? The teleological argument looks at the creation that we have, looks at these very detailed creatures, and says there is no way that just happened. And evolutionists can't explain it either. They try to. They say, oh, well, there are different bombardier beetles have different abilities. Some use a foam, which is true. Some don't have a cannon turret, which is also true. And they say, well, it's just an evolution thing. They just evolved. Yeah, but who got the first idea? Right? We understand that in order to get the first idea, they had to kill themselves off numerous times over before they even figured out how to make it work. But evolution says, well, no, they, they just managed to figure all that out at once. But then it took a little bit longer to figure out the different steps. Good for you. Thank you for believing that, right? We just sit there and we're like, what in the world? People don't want to believe in God so much that they make up these things that just don't make sense, do they? The teleological argument argues for the existence of God because of the design of the universe that we live in. Cosmological says we came from somewhere. Teleological said we were designed by somebody. We were designed by somebody. Number three. The anthropological argument says this, humans having personhood with self-awareness and moral self-determination points to a personal creator who has these qualities. As we look at the creation around us, we understand that we are different than the rest of creation, aren't we? We are. Look at the ability that humans have to govern ourselves. Look at the ability that humans have to put everything in submission underneath us, almost as if that was ordained by God, which who wants to read Genesis to prove that to be true, right? That was a joke, people. All right? We know that we were given submission over the universe. We were given that authority by somebody. Why are we different than all of creation? If we evolved, why aren't other things also evolving? Why? We don't have any answers for this, do we? We have moral awareness. We have self-determination that had to come from somewhere. The anthropological argument argues that that came from a creator who also has those same capabilities. And Genesis chapter 1 says this. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Which, by the way, is an argument for the Trinity because who's he talking to there? Let us make man... In our image, after our likeness, argument for the Trinity. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I'm going to focus on the image. Image of God. We are the only creatures with the image of God. Moral awareness, self-determination, reason, the ability to think, emotions, intellect, emotions, will. We have that from God. We're the only creation that has that. The anthropological argument states that we have these things and it had to come from somewhere. Because it had to come from somewhere, it must have come from a creator. Therefore, God exists. Now, can you break these arguments down? Absolutely. But again, it goes back to Hebrews chapter 11. Faith. When you have faith, you begin to see that these things make sense. Seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. Are you tracking with me so far? Are we on the same page? We're going to look at this last one. This last one is a weaker argument here, the ontological argument. This is going to blow your mind. You're going to love this one. If man could conceive of a perfect God who does not exist, then he could conceive of someone greater than God himself, which is impossible, therefore God exists. Now, does that make sense? 
you all are just sitting there looking at me. All right, come on, somebody laugh, help me out. I was sitting there going to that last night, like, what in the world does that even mean, right? And I've read it how many times this week. Paul Enns wrote this in his book, the, the Moody Handbook of Theology. If man could conceive of a perfect God who does not exist, then he could conceive of someone greater than God himself, which is impossible, therefore God exists. What? Okay, so I want to summarize this redneck style. All right, I want to summarize this redneck style. We have the idea of God. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? We have the idea that there's something greater than us. Where did it come from? If we didn't have the idea of someone greater than us, would that someone be in existence? We have the idea of someone greater than us, therefore that someone greater than us must exist. Rene Descartes said, he said, I think, therefore I am. Remember that phrase? I think, therefore I am. You know, to a degree, this is the same argument. And I'm going to say, you know, this is the weakest of the four arguments I'm presenting to you today. But there's some logic behind this, and there's a Bible verse that backs this up, okay? We believe that there is a God. And when you look at all the cultures that have ever existed, there is a recognition somewhere that there is a God that's out there. There is, and we phrase it this way, there is a God-sized hole in all of us, isn't there? There's an idea that there's something more and greater than us. In Acts chapter 17, Paul experienced this when he went to Athens. He says this, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Oropagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. They, even in Athens, believed in the unknown God. There was something out there. The ontological argument says, because man has this innate sense that there is something out there, that something out there gave them that innate sense, therefore that something out there exists. Is it a weak argument? Absolutely. But yet when you believe, you say, yeah, that's right. Because before I became a believer, I just felt that there was something there. And when I look at the cultures around me, and they want to believe in something, there's a God-sized hole in all of us. The ontological argument says that God-sized hole is God himself. Now, the so what? What, do we, what does all this mean for us? As we think about these arguments, here's what I want you to understand. Okay? J. Oliver Burswell, he said this in his book, Systematic Theology of Christian Religion. I gave two of these quotes to you. He says, We hold that these arguments do establish a presumption in favor of faith in God of the Bible. It should never be felt that these arguments have the demonstrative quality of mathematical processes. In other words, 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? That's empirical. This, not so much. He says, It ought to be recognized that all existential propositions are logically qualified by a greater or lesser degree of probability. In other words, as you look at these arguments, there is a greater degree of probability that all these arguments put together as one point to a creator, point to God. The cosmological argument pretty well stands by itself. Teleological, yes. Again, you get down to the, to the other arguments, and you start wondering just a little bit. Anthropological, ontological, those begin to get a little bit weaker. But when you put them all together, the probability of them being true are much greater, aren't they? But in and of themselves... They don't necessarily prove anything. We hold these arguments to establish a presumption in favor of faith. All right? He goes on to say this. He says, The unbeliever may well be convinced, and the Christian is greatly helped by the arguments, but we have far more. We have the convicting and regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. We are not groping uncertainly, not merely following a gleam, not taking a leap in the dark. We are walking in the light. We believe and we see. That's us as Christians. These arguments, these four that I listed, they may help an unbeliever be convinced. But we as Christians, we are greatly helped by those, aren't we? You're going to go out in the public this week and you're going to sound so smart. When was the last time you heard the cosmological argument for the existence of God? People are going to be like, here's your bag, thanks for shopping with us, right? <laughs> but it helps us understand a little bit, doesn't it? It helps us see a little bit more than maybe we did. This last phrase right here, he said, the evidence for the God of the Bible is sufficiently cogent to place upon us a moral responsibility. We must choose for or against God. We are in a world where sin and misery abound. The Christian gospel might be true. The evidence is strong enough so that we are morally culpable if we fail to give heed. That's what it comes down to, isn't it? 
It takes faith to believe in the culture's way of explaining the universe. It takes faith to believe in the Christian's way of explaining the universe. But there is enough evidence in these four arguments that we are morally culpable if we choose the wrong one. We are. God will hold us morally culpable. And God is real. So the final question I have for you guys today, are you for God or against God? Do you believe these arguments are true? Do you believe in God as a creator? Do you believe that God is real? We're going to come take the communion here in just a second. The communion table is a reminder that we at Grace Baptist Church, we do on the first Sunday of every month. It's a reminder of God sending His Son, God the Father sending His Son, Jesus Christ, who also is God, to this world. Christ died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. Does it take faith to believe that? Yes, it does. But again, as I look at their arguments, it leans heavier towards God than it does not. We're going to come here, we're going to take the communion. A reminder for what Christ did. Before we do that, you have an opportunity to think, you know what, am I right with God? Am I spiritually right with God? The Apostle Paul warns against those who take the communion without being prepared. He says, you will take punishment upon yourself. You will bring judgment upon yourself for doing that. This is just a symbol, yes, but it's a symbol of a right relationship with God. And if we don't have one of those and we take it to this table, then God has cautioned us against doing that. But if you are right with God, and you say, you know what, Pastor, I agree that all these arguments are true. I agree there is a God, and I have made myself right with Him. That we do encourage you to take with us. If you're not there, then here's a moment. You don't have to come up here. You don't come up forward. You don't have to talk to me. You don't have to do anything. You just have to say, you know what, God? For the first time, I believe that you are right. I believe that you exist. And God, I believe that I need you as my Savior. Will you be my Savior today? And when you do that, God says, he said, if you confess our sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. And you'll be right in God's eyes. As the men come forward,